Medis. Uh, this webinar is presented by Lawrence Graham's Commerce and Technology Group as part of our Smart Law program, and I'm joined today by my colleagues and fellow group members, Vanessa de Froberville and Peter Brudenel. The format for today is that we'll have three presentations, each of around 15 minutes, and then we'll conclude with a Q&A session and aim to close in around an hour's time. You'll see from the slide on your screens at the moment that there's a dialogue box for you to submit any questions at any time during the presentations, and we'll receive and collate those questions and then discuss the most popular questions and issues raised in the Q&A session at the end of the presentations. I would add that we do have over 70 participants registered for the session, and so I apologize in advance if we haven't addressed all of the questions sent in by the end of the Q&A session. During the course of this webinar, we're going to be looking at a range of remedies available when there's been a breach of contract, including those remedies which might be provided for in the contract, such as liquidated damages and service credits, as well as termination rights and general damages claims. So Vanessa is first going to be looking at the principles of how loss is measured and its relevance to the contractual damages that can be recovered under English law, because the payment of money is the remedy that remains at the heart of English contract law. Then Peter will look at some of those alternatives to an ordinary damages action that I mentioned, namely liquidated damages and service credits, explaining what they are, how they operate, and when to consider using them. And then to conclude, I'm going to consider contract termination, focusing on the key termination events, but also with a brief word on the consequences of termination in certain scenarios. Now I'm pleased to start our presentations by introducing Vanessa with our first presentation on measuring loss and recovering damages. Vanessa. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. I've been asked to talk to you this afternoon about how loss is measured and where a contract has been breached and how damages are recovered. Two quite large topics, and many a tome has been written on the subject, so quite a lot to get through, but I hope this is going to be a useful overview in advance of the other presentations. I'm going to start by talking about where a claim for damages sits and the possible remedies available to an aggrieved claimant. The remedies available for breach of contract can be conveniently split between agreed remedies, for example, liquidated damages and service credits, which Peter is going to touch on and talk about in a minute, self-help remedies, such as set-off or retention of title clauses, which can also be included into contracts, and judicial remedies, i.e. remedies available through the courts, which include damages, specific performance, and injunctions. In English law, damages are the core remedy for cases of breach of contract, and this remedy is available as of right. It should be contrasted with the alternative equitable remedies, such as specific performance or an injunction, which are discretionary remedies and they will not be available if monetary damages would provide an adequate remedy. Now, the general rule is that where a contract has been breached and the claimant has suffered loss, the claimant is entitled to be put into the position that he would have been in had the contract been properly performed. So you'll see from the statement on the slide that what we're talking about is about net loss to the claimant i.e. after the benefits that arise to the claimant from the breach of contract have been taken into account. And these could include savings in tax that would otherwise have been payable, savings made in the cost of performing the claimant's part of the contract, and the value of the goods retained. Subject to what I'm going to say shortly, if a contract has been breached but the claimant cannot show loss, then generally they will be entitled only to nominal damages. So the assessment of damages is effectively a two-stage process. Firstly, the question is, what is the appropriate measure of damage? And the second, what limiting factors should be considered? Now, there are three distinct measures that a claimant may rely on to measure damage, and each of which may be dealt with separately when considering their claim for damages. The first, the claimant's expectation interest, the second, their reliance interest, and thirdly, their restitution interest. An expectation interest looks forward and reflects the financial gain or benefit that the claimant would expect to receive had the contract been properly performed. Typically, in a commercial contract, this would be a loss of anticipated profit. 
A claimant's expectation under a contract can be quantified by reference to the cost of cure or by reference to diminution in value. Now, in the Ruxley Electronics case, the claimant based his claim on cost of cure, but in fact was only awarded a very small sum of damages for loss of amenity when his swimming pool was not constructed in accordance with the contract specifications agreed in advance between the two parties. Now, a reliance measure of damages, on the other hand, looks backwards and reflects the expense which the claimant has incurred in anticipation of the performance of the contract and which has been lost as a result of the defendant's breach. An award of damages on a reliance basis is designed to put the claimant in the position he would have been in had the contract not been made. Now, although reliance damages are calculated in a different way to expectation damages, i.e. by putting the claimant in the position they would have been in if the contract had never been made, rather than compensating them for the loss of profit stemming from this contract. In the recent case of OMAC Maritime, the High Court ruled that reliance damages could be analyzed in the same way as expectation damages, so as to ensure that in this particular case, that the vessel owners were not put in a better position than they would have been in had their contract with the charterers been performed. Now, this was only effectively a first instance decision, so we've yet to see how the courts will apply it going forward. Lastly, a restitution measure of damages is intended to restore to the victim of breach of contract the benefit that the defaulting party has gained. There are two circumstances in which such a remedy may apply. The first one is a straightforward one where there has been payment by the claimant of consideration, but no consideration has been given by the defendant in return. And the second, where the defaulting party has profited from the breach of contract that the claimant has not necessarily suffered loss, which is sometimes known as unjust enrichment. Now, the recent unjust enrichment cases have been interesting, and I just want to touch on them briefly. They're up on the slides. The first one is Attorney General and Blake, and the other is Attorney General and R. And just to briefly mention the facts, on Attorney General and R, this concerned the publication of a book by R, who was formerly a member of the SAS, regarding his memoirs of the first Gulf War, and that's Bravo 2.0. The second is in relation to Attorney General and Blake, which relates to the double agent George Blake, who also published an autobiography after escaping to Russia after being sentenced to a long prison sentence in the UK. Now, in both cases, there was a written contract between the MOD and the individual concerned with strict confidentiality clauses. Now, ordinarily, in an action for breach of contract, the damages would be based not on the profits made by the defendant, but on the loss made by the claimant. Now, it would therefore follow that the Attorney General would have no claim for the publishing fees due to the two individuals. But the House of Lords and the Privy Council thought otherwise, and that a restitutionary remedy ought to be available to the Attorney General in both of those cases. Now, in a recent case, the High Court was able to extend the scope of remedies, which are restitutionary rather than purely compensatory in nature. And that can be seen in the Force India case, which is also up on your slides. And that concerned a contract to test drive a Formula One car for 6,000 kilometers. But the claimant actually only got to drive the car for approximately, or just over, I think, 2,000 kilometers. Now, in this case, Justice Stadlin was unable to award restitutionary damages but achieved the same result by granting damages representing the value of the outstanding test drive. Now, let's have a look at the factors which might limit the damages flowing from the breach. Causation. Now, it goes without saying that the claimant, to succeed in a claim for damages for breach of contract, must show the causal connection between the breach and the loss. There are no formal tests as to causation, and the general position is that the court relies on common sense to guide its decisions in these matters. Now, turning to remoteness of damages issues, 
Without legal restraint, a victim could point to all loss resulting from a particular breach of contract as being recoverable, however improbable, or indeed however unpredictable. But common law states that a man is not to be held liable for the infinite consequences of his wrongful act. Now this leads us to having in Baxendale the holy grail of all uh, remoteness damages cases, and that resulted in a two-stage test that a claimant may recover damages for breach of contract where the damage is A, arising naturally, i.e. according to the usual course of things, or B, such as may reasonably be supposed to have been in contemplation of the parties at the time they made their contract as a probable result of the breach. The distinction between these two limbs is the degree of knowledge attributable to the party in breach at the time of making the contract. Now the law on remoteness has also been further considered in more recent cases and I've put those up on your slides. The first case that I want to have a look at is the House of Lords case of Transfield Shipping. And the Lords effectively sought to extend the rule in Hadley and Baxendale by introducing a legal assumption of responsibility test as a key determining factor of whether damages are recoverable. Now this is a shipping case that involved a very significant claim for damages based on the late redelivery of a vessel by only nine days. Now it was held that it would not ordinarily be the case, nor would it have been the party's intention that such a short delay would expose the charterers to such a significant financial liability. But some judges proposed a new approach to the remoteness test, and that was whether the loss was one for which the defaulting party could reasonably be regarded as having assumed responsibility. Now, the Court of Appeal also considered the Transfield shipping case in the Supershield case, and the Court said that Hadley and Baxendale remained the standard rule but that there may be exceptional circumstances where the court, considering both the contract and the commercial background, may decide that the standard approach would not meet the expectation or intention of the parties, and so not give an equitable result in that case. Now, the last case I want to have a look at is the case of Sylvia Shipping. And this further clarified the applicability of the broader approach of the Transfield shipping case. Now, under Sylvia, there was another claim for loss of profit on a cancelled subcharter due to late redelivery. Now, the judge thought that it was important to make clear at the outset that there was no new generally applicable legal test of remoteness in damages. The orthodox approach under Hadley and Baxendale remains the general approach which will apply in the vast majority of cases, he said, and it works perfectly well. And so there should be no confusion as to potentially alternative tests. But the court did still confirm that as indicated in Transfield shipping and the Supershield cases, there may be scope in unusual cases where the general test resulted in an unpredictable uncontrollable or disproportionate liability or a liability for which there is clear evidence would be contrary to market understanding and expectations. Then the court could look to the assumption of responsibility formulation if it gave a more equitable result. Now the last thing I want to touch on is looking at the obligation to mitigate and that falls on the claimant and is likely to be a limiting factor on the extent of the damages which might be claimed. Now, as a general rule, the claimant cannot recover damages for any part of their loss which they could have avoided by taking reasonable steps. There are effectively two steps to be taken. The first is a positive one, being to take reasonable steps to minimize loss. And the second, a negative one, being not to take any unreasonable steps to increase the loss. Now that's my hugely quick canter through loss and damages in contract law, and with that I'm going to swiftly hand over to Peter.